So uh, the guy who runs Paving the Way Home, uh, a website which takes some of the homilies from here and uh, helps people to, I suppose, listen to them in some way, uh, just sent me on some statistics today. So I actually realized that we have 37% of our viewers, our listeners are from Ireland, 32% are from the USA, and 25 from the UK. So to all of you non-Irish people out there, I'm really sorry that I speak so quickly and use a, a lot of Irishisms. Um, so I don't really speak international English while I'm here. I just, I speak country Irish. So very sorry if uh, um, I can't always be understood and use, walk, use words like footpath instead of sidewalk. But I think you get the general principle. Anyway, okay. So it's great to have you. Uh, it's great to, to, to be able to witness to what the Lord is doing and what the Lord does every year and how the, the depth of scripture can be, can be uncovered and no matter how often we do this, we, do, we should be doing this every year, no matter how often we hear these readings and dig deeper and deeper, it should reveal ever greater available depths. You know, we should never get to the point where we go, oh yeah, sure, I, I, I've heard that story before, so I know how it ends. It's not about knowing how the story ends. It's about knowing how that story applies to you and what you're being called to. And maybe in a way, what your part is in this story. See, we're not spectators. In this whole passion, that's why it's, we all have that horrible line uh, in, when we read the, the accounts of the passion where we have to stand there and say, crucify me. I'm not sure about you, but I always felt bad reading that line, especially when you read it with a bit of gusto. Um, we had one of our community members here who, when we were filming the Stations of the Cross, with particular gusto, would, ro well, mime or roar, crucify And she's a very gentle girl. Uh, but like, the venom came out. And it was just, it was great. I mean, it, was, it makes for very good stations to cross because it looks so vicious. Um, but we, we all feel bad when we have to say those lines, crucify him, crucify him. And yet it, it makes sense. Why? Because we're, we're part of the story. We're not spectators in the passion. We're part of it. Our sin has caused this, and we are the beneficiaries of, of everything that's going to happen over the next couple of days. God's grace made available to us in Christ. So, one thing which uh, I was I was asking, I was praying there a couple of days ago, and I was um, I'm going to pray every day, but there was just a couple of days ago uh, when I was thinking about a particular thing. As I was thinking, Lord, what, what would I like? What would I? What would I like to kind of pray for? What kind of gift would I like? And there were a couple of things that came to mind, but one of them was. I said, Lord, I'd love to have a better memory, right? I'd love to have a better memory. I'd love to be able to remember details about people so that when they would come to me, I'd know their name and what their kids' names were, are, and uh, maybe even, you know, when they got married and all that kind of thing, so that they'd feel special. I mean, if, some, if, if when people come and say, hello, Father, and I'm, oh, hello, Mary, how are you getting on? How are the children, John and Patricia, and so on? Oh, Bless us. It just makes them feel like, you know, you care. And I do care. It's just I don't remember stuff. I don't remember things like, like, as I'd like to, you know? So I thought, I'd love, I'd love that gift. And uh, I came across an article of a lady, she's an American, named Jill Price. And uh, she has what looked on the surface like an almost photographic memory of everything, right? So she has, she can remember in great detail, so practically every aspect of her life, I think from the age of 11 up, it's from the age of eight up, the age of eight up, she can remember practically everything like it happened yesterday. So the, the, the part journalist, part scientist, well, more of a scientist who wrote this paper, uh, went to interview her. So he said, look, I'll, we'll start with a few easy ones. So uh, Easter 1982, so you were nine years of age. What was it like? And she goes on in great detail to, to say what day of the week it was. As in, so, you know, uh, he gave her a certain date and she was able to say the date, what day of the week it was, what happened then, who came to visit, what the weather was like, what happened the day before, and then there was a big political disaster or whatever it was the following day, and she just, just tons of information. He just, he just gave her a date. Then he asked, you know, another day, a random date, uh, another, a couple of years later, and again, same kind of thing, you know, one memory starts to trick another, tr trigger another, trigger another, and just all in, in great detail. She was on the, um, a TV show called 2020, 
where she was asked all sorts of questions about uh, American history and things. And then it came to a kind of a general knowledge question of when did Princess Grace die? Now, I don't remember the date. Uh, that's her gift, not mine, so correct me if I'm wrong. But um, she says something like, it was, she says, September 14th, 82. And they said, no, no, it was, it was September 10th, 82. And she said, no, it wasn't. That was, that was the day. And they said, well, that's, sorry, that's, this is a quiz. Like, it's a live TV show, you know what I mean? And she said, no, it wasn't. And, and then she's, she, 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 I, I can't be, I can't be wrong, like, you know, and then she, she, she went on to tell what happened the days before and the days after, and no, absolutely convinced it was the date that she said. I said, well, sorry, we, we, we can't, we can't, we can't give you the points, like, it's, it's, uh, it's not the answer we have. So they moved on anyway, and then you see an embarrassed producer come in two minutes later, we checked it, she's right. <laughs> the book was wrong, the book that they got the, the date from was wrong, you know? So just, she has an uh, absolutely, phenomenal memory and I was like yeah that's that might be what I'd like I'm not really sure I don't I maybe that's what I'd like but then the the, the journalist goes on to, to talk to her about about her, her her life and her past and her and her, her childhood and to also trying to understand how the human how human memory works because we don't really know how it works we can remember certain things, you can't remember other things. Other things, it's really hard to shove them into your brain. Other things you remember immediately, especially the stuff we're not supposed to remember. You know, like someone tells you a dirty joke, you'll never forget that, right? But then you're trying to put your five times tables in your head or learn a bit about the prophet Ezekiel and they just, you know, learn off Bible verses and they just won't stay. Anyway, long story. Uh, so we can remember some things, we can't remember other things, but you can also confuse a person. Uh, we can suggest memories, you know, with a leading question, you can kind of get people to say things they don't even believe, you know, it's incredible. So the mind is complicated. So he, he started digging a little into, into this lady's life and came to, to, to recognize that there were actually large holes in, in her memory of, of certain things and that her memory, especially of her own personal life, really kicked off at the trauma of moving house. So when she was eight years of age, her pa parents moved house, and that, that shook her world. Then there was another trauma of her parents having to, having to s separate and move. And she has such a great knowledge of her past because she lives there constantly. So she watches TV most of the day and just replays her past over and over and over again. She has a bedroom full of all of her childhood toys. She writes a diary every day of everything that she's done. She has TV guides dating back to 1980, whatever it was. And uh, she lives physically here and mentally in the past. And all of her hurts, pains, traumas, separations, all those kind of things are right there. Like they just happened. They're all present. So even though she has this phenomenal gift in a way, it's really not doing her any good. It's not actually helping her. It's, you know, you'd imagine with that kind of thing, sure, you could, you could be an incredible scientist or invent a cure for cancer because you just keep all this information in your head and piece it all together. And, and no, she's, she's paralyzed, actually. She's just stuck, stuck in her, in her world. So it just got me thinking how you kind of have to be careful what you wish for. You know, it's like the Midas touch. You know, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. It sounds amazing. <laughs> And then, you know, you see a big juicy apple, clunk, turns to gold. You see your little child, clunk, she turns to gold. You know, it, yeah. Be careful what you wish for. So when we, when we talk about following God, I think most people say, yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's good to believe in God, believe there's something there, to believe there's a kind of a, a spiritual reality. Absolutely, it's a good thing, sure. Following God has consequences. It, it, has, it has real implications for, for our lives. By the way, they're, they're all good, ultimately, but they're not all necessarily easy. So following, following the Lord, like, it has very, very serious consequences. So this, this reading from Ezekiel, right? So uh, this is during the, the deportation, okay? So they're, they're not in the Holy Land. So Ezekiel and, and the Jews uh, were taken in, into Babylon. So he's prophesying there. So not 
in his home country, where the temple has been destroyed, uh, the Ark of the Covenant has been lost. Um, they're in a, in a foreign country, now surrounded by foreigners, they're, they're, they're enslaved, they're like, not a good situation. So the Lord says, I'm going to take these sons of Israel from the nations where they have gone. I will gather them together from everywhere, and I will bring them home to their own soil. I shall make them into one nation in my own land and on the mountains of Israel. And one king is to be king of them all. There will no longer be two nations. We won't go into how the two nations happened, but yeah, okay, so there were southern kingdom of Judah, northern kingdom of Israel. There'll be one nation. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and their filthy practices and all their sins. I shall rescue them from all the betrayals that they have been guilty of. I will cleanse them. They shall be my people and I will be their God. A couple of lines later, he goes on to, to repeat that. I will be their God and they shall be my people. But this happens like after, after a purification. After like the people have decided, God, we, we want you more than anything. We don't want these, these filthy practices and all these things that we've been doing. So the Lord is still at work and will still realize this promise in us today. So, I mean, I'm not, the world is in absolute chaos at the, in, at the moment. It's going to, and it's going to get far worse. It, it, it really will. Because, but not because, not, because, not because I say so. But because only when, when the cross causes us to drop to our knees will we recognize who God is. So it'll be an act of mercy for God to actually lead us back to him through the cross. Because unfortunately, there's no other way. Would we listen to prophets? Do you know, if in Medjugorje or elsewhere there was some, to be some visionary who would say, if, it were, if a Vatican statement were to come out and say, sure, we already have those kind of things. We already have like, teachings of the church which say abortion is unacceptable. We did it anyway. Genetic modification, all those kind of things, that they were unacceptable. We do it anyway. IVF, we do it anyway. Contraception, we do it anyway. So we, we already have these teachings. We don't listen to them. Okay, so we're beginning to see the consequences of that now in society as family falls apart and as uh, fatherhood is destroyed and as uh, superficial relationships become, become the norm. So promising us happiness but delivering emptiness and use and loneliness. So like, there's, there's such misery out there. So the Lord, in his mercy, will say, okay, if, if I need to allow a situation which brings you to your knees, this is still an act of mercy. So it will, but it will begin to purify us. Because it'll, uh, who was it? I was talking to, yeah, talking to a guy recently who was, um, uh, I was just buying a bit of steel for a bit of a, a trailer job that I have to do today. And, uh, and he was talking about his, his brother who, who died of alcoholism at 43, so just two years older than me. And he said, you know, we used to work night and day here in the, in the forge, making gates and shoeing horses and the whole lot. Just night and day, day and night, six days a week, like just non-stop going. And he said, after my brother died, I just stopped and said, what? What am I doing? What, what am I doing with my life? Is all of this worth it? And he said, you know, I, I often get into the car or into the the truck, see I can speak American, uh, and get into his SUV and go for a wee drive to be going, doing, doing a job over here, but he's not kind of driving this way and after half an hour he kind of come to and go, where, where was I supposed to be going again? I was supposed to be going back to care, you know, just, just, just kind of out of it as regards where his life was going. And so he said, no, I need a radical change. And this is kind of what can happen when the Lord allows a bit of a shake-up, that we think, Jeannie, is this, it's, just, it's just not important what shoes I wear or what schnazzy haircut I have. It just, these things are just entirely unimportant. And we think of the big things, the really important things, like the salvation of our souls, like the, the condition of our soul, like how God sees us. These are the things that count, and these are the things that are given no airtime whatsoever. We're going to leave here eventually. And we're going to meet God eventually. So are we, are we, are we ready? So following God, it's, 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 we, can, we can wish it for ourselves and for others, and I hope we do. But there are, there are consequences, kind of like having a good memory, right? It, it, it is a great gift, but there, but there are consequences. It means you'll also remember the hurts. Following, following the Lord, there are so many, so many blessings and graces available to us. But it also means 
that we'll have to change. There are certain things in my life I cannot keep doing if I follow the Lord. I just can't. I mean, it's, you see it in the States, we see it here as well. If you have politicians, especially in the States at the moment, if you have a politician who calls himself Catholic, but doesn't abide by Catholic morality, people say, well, sure, he, he's Catholic and he's pro-abortion. It, you know, it undermines the whole thing. So we, we have to live by our faith. So what's the, what's the next step? If following the Lord has these, these kind of positive, positive consequences, and I'm not sure, if there's, there probably is a better way of, of phrasing it, but like there are positive consequences to following the Lord. Things will be different, we will be different, our, the way we use our time will be different, but overall we will be so much happier. We won't have regrets, we won't ever have this kind of you know, Sunday morning guilt from what we did on Saturday night. We'll have peace, we'll experience what it, what it means to look at another person purely. You know, it, it, we, our hearts will be, will be set on heaven. So, back on St. Patrick's Day, uh, I was talking to Father Paul, the founder of my community, and normally on, on the, the day of our saint, we, we ask Father Paul, who is, as I say, he's my spiritual director, but also the founder of our community, we ask him what particular grace does, does God want to, to give me today, you know, or what particular grace should I correspond with today? And he said, he's Austrian, so he said in German, sich ganz in Gott verlieren, which means to lose oneself entirely in God. Just to kind of let yourself just sink into God. And it's one of those things that sounds so obvious. Oh yeah, completely. When was it, and I, was, I just couldn't help but ask myself, when was the last time I did that? Do you know, in, in adoration or in the chapel here, where you're not in the chapel as such, doing anything, you're not there kind of, I have to get through my breviary, or I have to get through my rosary, or I want to write my spiritual diary, or whatever it is, read through this passage of the Divine Mercy, all good things to do, but when was the last time I just allowed myself to just be a such absorbed into God, just to rest in Him? To allow yourself to be a such lost in God. It's uh, an image that uh, he, he gave me on a, on a different occasion. He said, you know when you go to bed, especially in the winter, and you've got a big puffy duvet on you, and uh, your grand mattress below you, and your soft owl pillow, and even in those kind of moments, just imagine yourself kind of, you know, this is like the father's embrace. You know, he's, he's a bit... I mean, you're, you're hugging someone who's a little more rotund. It's very, you know, you can just kind of... <laughs> it's kind of like that. You know, you're kind of... Allowing yourself to be kind of surrounded by God. Just enveloped in Him. And loved by Him. You're just surrounded by the love of God. And you're not doing it. Just in the same way like we meditated a couple of days ago. Children, ch babies, don't, can't do anything to earn love. In fact, if anything, they, just, they cause you sleepless nights. Oh, who, um, yeah, Maura, who works here, she said she was due to come here yesterday evening, and she said, yeah, sorry, I'm a bit late. We had a bit of a punami. <laughs> now, now, I had never heard the term before, but I think it's class. Oh, yeah, punami, so it's apparently when the nappy explodes and, or, you know, up and down the baby grows, and you know what I mean. <laughs> Daily bread for parents, just like, that's the way it is, just take the child. I mean, he just sits there and goes, <laughs> and you're like, we're late. <laughs> now I have, to, I have to bath you because I'm genie. And, uh, you know, and this is just, this is just what, parents, what parents do. So they can, the child can't earn love, but as soon as the baby is clean, little Samuel is going to be picked up and held by wee Mara and, and loved. So, so with us, we can't earn God's love. But he is father, so he just wants to to pick us up and just love us. And you can imagine, like, he's trying to pick us up and love us, like, no, so, sorry, God, I'm busy writing my spiritual diary right now. <laughs> you know? Or, sorry, no, I'm busy, I have to finish, I have to finish this prayer, I have to finish this prayer. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm the point of prayer. <laughs> you know? I'm where all this is supposed to be leading. You know? Let yourself be loved. Let yourself be loved.
So our gospel finishes with this cliffhanger. The Jewish Passover drew near, and many of the country people who had gone up to Jerusalem to purify themselves looked out for Jesus, saying to one another as they stood about in the temple, what do you think? Will he come to the festival or not? We know that not only will the Lord come in doing so, he will fulfill all of the Old Testament prophecies and establish a new priesthood and a new covenant with us until the end of time. So following the Lord has consequences, but ultimately all of them are good. And whatever we leave behind, we will not miss. Because whatever we give up for the Lord, we receive a hundredfold. So as we prepare now for tomorrow's celebration for this Holy Week, let us allow ourselves to be loved, doted on, embraced by the Father, who loved the world so much that he gave his only son. Amen.